Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Triangle Button Podcast. With me today, I have my good buddy, Caleb. How are you doing today, man? Happy to be here. That's good. That's good. So, uh, you know, let's kick it up. Like, what did we think about the last two episodes of The Last of Us? We liked it. That's the simple. Oh, we liked it a lot. It was Um, good. (laughs) I'm glad we're talking about them together because they really do work as a unit. I, yeah, they, they flow into each other a lot. I felt like I've been sort of trying to reel the internet in on The Last of Us, where episode three came out and everyone said, this is the best episode ever of the entire show. It's amazing. And I'm like, hold on, it's good. But they'll be, it's good. Yeah. It's really good. But I would say it was the best episode of TV in the last decade or century. I'm like, I'm like okay. It's, yeah. Let, let's just keep our, our heads <laughs> screwed onto our bodies. Screwed on, no worries. We're good. Yeah. And then episode four comes out and a bunch of people are kind of like, eh, I don't know. I'm bored. I remember you were talking to me. You're like, I mean, they were a little slow at times. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Hold okay. on. They're I'm going to clarify my side, ladies and gentlemen. Don't worry. I will clarify what I meant by this. We're, we're developing the relationships. We're getting character development. This isn't like when Walking Dead is slow, when we're just looking oh, at Oh, that's a slow show. <laughs> this is Walking Dead. This it is- took the five seasons to get to the third volume. <laughs> I know, okay. So like, like, this isn't The Walking Dead. This is building characters. It's building the relationships, which is very, very important that they do this early on because we haven't really gotten to see an episode of just building Joel and Ellie's interactions and there is a change throughout it, and I, I really liked that. Um, so I, I think that the fourth episode, it was great character development, had a great action set piece. I loved the shootout. It was grounded. It was realistic. It was all practical effects. Uh, and even de- right down to the part where, you know, Ellie had to go behind the wall and just hear Joel brutalize the poor man. And then I'm, uh, it ended on a cliffhanger, and then that transitions us into the best episode of the season so far. Really, episode because it had not only an excellent an excellent story or excellent action like previous episodes. It had Mm. both. The action was as good, if not better, than the action in the first episode. We got to see like a fire lit, intense slaughter between the infected and the ravagers of Kansas City, and it was beautiful. We also got to see one of the most heart-wrenching moments in the game, which was that they find two other survivors, and these two other survivors are like them in that they care about each other, and they're just trying to make it out alive in this world, but they care about each other first and foremost, which mm-hmm. is that important. they are survivors, as Joe likes in the game. <laughs> yeah. And they show that I'm a, <clears throat> that mirroring between the two of them and as it builds up throughout and we see the ending and we see what happens to henry when when he kills sam um when he kills sam for the greater good right like he he shoots his own brother to save this little girl and we see what that does to him on the inside that he he ends his own life almost immediately after excuse me um it really has on yeah, it really has an effect. So, uh, yeah, without going into too many details, I'd say I loved these last two episodes. And this, I hope they keep up this quality in the future. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's like, you know, just going back to like, um, you know, what was it? Episode four? Episode four and five were on, right? Was it the we're numbers? On, we just finished episode five, yes. It's the episode five. Okay, so, so going back to episode four, I just want to clarify I did like that episode. I really, like, I did. I just felt like it was very much like one of those episodes where you got to take like the back seat and you're just like, getting like just the one-on-one interactions. And I'm totally fine with that. It's just like from if you were looking at it from like a story like perspective, they just kind of slowly progress. It was a very miniature progression of the story, if that makes sense. And I liked what you said, like the action piece when they go with and crash into that building. I loved how it was like realistic and like how like it's literally just Joel just trying to shoot like every single guy and the I don't know when Ellie like pulls out the gun and like shoots him I like that change how she doesn't kill him she just injures him 
because like she hasn't kind of made that step to like killing an actual person. Right. So mm. um, actually, I don't know. Did, did she say that she killed somebody already or did she just say like she injured? I think she uh, said she killed someone. Okay. She killed. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. It might've been like again, but like, you know, she, like, they implied that she had, she would never do it again. And just like witnessing like how like he starts crying out for like his mother and like just why they go back and how they'll trade. That was that was a great element. That was kind of heart wrenching because it just shows like both of like how these are really just people and they do have their own like lives. And at the same time, they'll use that sympathy against them. And I like that element. Now, the rest of the episode was good. I like the joke at the end. The pun book is hilarious and amazing. I love that little element that like. Yes. Oh, diarrhea running in your jeans. <laughs> Fucking hilarious. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, I know. It's just classic. Also, I got to say, Bella Ramsey has stepped up her game in these last two episodes as well. Like, I, I actually am like, she sounds like Ellie and she just embodies the character so well. I was really shocked and I was really glad to have seen that. Now, going into like the next episode. Uh, Sam and Henry. I was kind of shocked when I saw that like Sam was deaf. I was not prepared for that. And immediately I started thinking, how are they going to navigate this world where it is so crucial to not only see, but hear every, your, all your surroundings. That was my first thought. And we almost see like how that could almost get him in trouble too. how he almost enters that door in the castle. Just immediately was like, oh, yeah, let's go. And they made him younger, too. So the innocence is there, too. So I like that element and that action piece. Oh, my God. I thought it was just a bloater. I did not expect there to be a full-fledged attack of the infected. That was some of the best shit ever. Oh, my God. And seeing the bloater rip that guy from, like, inside the mouth. You remember how they do, <laughs> do it? Exactly? I was like... <laughs> Ooh, like right there. That's exactly the scene. That's exactly what happens in the game. <laughs> Anytime. So loud, even though I was watching it by myself, I said, oh yeah, I didn't expect someone to bring that in from the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I love how it's like the silhouette too. So it just leaves the mind to the imagination. Just see it like the shreds apart. <laughs> I, w I was just like, I don't remember this thing being as like huge in the, like, in the game. I like how huge and monstrous and invincible it is. Mm -hmm. And oh, that was good. And I, I noticed that when Joel is shooting the rifle. Oh, oh, yeah. I just remember that old man with the rifle and how Joel's like, no, just no. All you got to do, stay up here for an hour. And how like it's almost like it's so bad in this world that it's just better to die than stay in the city and go under the grueling conditions of what humans have put against. You. Yes. And that. Oh, that's heart. That's kind of heart. That's heart wrenching in itself. That that's what it's come to. Well, like if he got caught as a deserter or a traitor, like he would you're be good as you're about as good as dead, and you're tortured. Yeah. Um. And. But yeah, the the moment that I saw was that when like Joel is shooting, he makes a conscious decision to save Ellie and not Sam and Henry. I don't know if you notice that, like, he looks over and then he's like, nope, we gotta save Ellie. It's like, I was kind of shocked, because as you know, when we played the game, you, you just shoot zombies at random. You don't really give a shit. And no matter what you do, like, you know, Sam's going down. But yeah, the final scene with Sam and how he draws everything and how he's like, will you save me? And Ellie puts her own blood on the wound, thinking it'll solve the issue. Yeah. Yeah, that was like, Part of me thought like, oh, it's the show. Maybe they're they made they gave Frank and Bill a happy ending. Maybe they'll rescue Sam. And then oh. as, as I'm sitting like super still in the morning, I realized. No, no, <laughs> that's, not what that's what I was. I was for a moment. I saw him just kind of sitting there and I was like, wait a second. He's just sitting there. And then like, you know, uh, like Tage was like, oh, shit, he's deaf. I forgot he's a dev zombie now. <laughs> or like, and I was like, it just kind of realized I'm like, oh right, that, that that doesn't get cured no matter what. So he's just a dev zombie. And just seeing him like attack and the acting was superb in that scene. I think the like 
that was a very good episode. I don't know. For me, episode three and episode five are tied. Because five, okay, if we think if we look at it just from a a balance of story narrative and like action set pieces, I think episode five just fucking knocked it out of the park. But if we're going for just pure story, I think that the third episode was better. Does that uh, make sense? Like, because I thought the story was good, but it was a lot more like just d- dialogue, if that makes more sense, and exposition, which is fine. Like, and that's fine. I don't mind, like, you know, a little bit of dialogue to explain the story details. I just found that three, it was very much a show, don't tell. And five was a bit of both, but more just like, okay, this is what happened with Henry. This is like, they, they showed like how they got to meet Joel and Ellie, but they were going more on the pretenses of, you know, oh, yeah, why am I getting captured? Because, you know, they're after me because I'm a traitor. And then it was, actually, I did kill somebody. It was this guy because I betrayed him. And then it was, you know what I mean? Which is fine. I don't mind those story elements because the game does that a lot too. Because that's your main form of understanding and developing, well, developing your connection with the character. I'm just saying, like, purely from a story element, I would give the edge slightly off to episode. Ooh, that's a, you've brought up a tough concept. Mm-hmm. <laughs> On- I, in ascending order, I would rank the episodes two, four, three, one, five. I yeah, think- one's really good. I think I, I do the almost the same order, but I would switch out. Um, I would make it three is the top, then it's five, then it's two, one. Okay. Okay. Because one is really oh god, Sarah dying gets me every like that was I find her better in this version than the game. I don't know if you agree. That was more heartbreaking in them like watching that shit. Oh uh, okay, yeah. I see him uh Yeah. You see what I'm saying though? It's like I think they're both great. I think balance five has it in the bag. One like, like not one, sorry. Uh episode three, it just does a great show, don't tell. It's just everything was like filmed in such a cinematic way of here are these two people. You show their love. It's not telling it. They're showing it through a progressive year, a progression of years. And I like that detail. I love how they show that the shots like were all cinematically. It was very much like, OK, let's take a break from the grueling world world of The Last of Us and let's give a sense of love and compassion. For there are a few. I'll, I'll say there there's. Two things about episode three mm-hmm. that hold it back. Now, okay. episode three, <clears throat> for context, mm-hmm. it was beautiful. Yep. The dialogue was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had honestly like a nice pace. It was never really boring. And the ending was, it was a gut punch to be sure. Oh, man, I cried. I almost cried at this time too. I was getting I close. This time I was like, I, it was a battle. But it was I was sucking those. St- I know, same here. I'm like, I was okay. You know what? I was getting teary eyed when I first saw Sam and how like they made him younger. They made him deaf. They made him so fucking vulnerable and so loving. And I like how like like you know Henry isn't an asshole this time around. You remember how he's like, "Hey, what did I tell you? Nothing in the bag, only supplies, only survival." And like he's very much like a parent. And this one, he's just like that. Like you know, hey, this place is really ugly. Let's decorate the place with the coloring book. You know what I mean? Henry, in that moment, when he he shoots Sam, and he points the gun at Joel, and then he says, I'm, uh, what did I do? What did I do? Mm-hmm. I'm just like sitting there, and I'm in Henry's shoes, and I'm like struggling against every cell in my body to like be like, it's okay, you've seen this in the game, man. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I know. I was like, it happened happened it's just that little change where he's like what did i do as he's aiming it because of the game it's like he shoots and then says that and then points it's like it's your fault it's your fucking fault and and this one i like that i'm like i like how they just made it what have i done you know like and he's just he, it's almost like he just can't realize he cannot comprehend like that is his first technical killing the first one was just like he betrayed someone that got killed this time it's he actually shot the gun All of the people that lost their lives in this episode, other than Sam, died because of Henry's decision. 
all of them. Like, if you trace back the trail of events, hmm? he killed the leader of the resistance and then put Kathleen in charge, yep. which led to this bloodbath, which led to her witch hunt and all of the, her sending all of these people out to the outskirts of town to die in this fight. He started this entire political schism and battle just because he wanted to get Sam out of the city. And then he does, but Sam gets bitten. And then all of that blood loss was in vain. And it's just a really tragic... It's it's seeing this man sacrifice the world for one person, and then it's still just not working out. And I just thought that was a beautiful, um, uh, kind of a beautiful tragedy. It also just tells you a lot about like this world, right? Like there are consequences for your actions. Unfortunately, they come back and they take you out. Like especially like on the ones that you love. And yeah, it was a it was a very it was just a sad scene. And Ellie and Sam's interactions too were like so like tight. Like, you know, when they're playing soccer with each other and you know, they're reading comic books and they're like, I got these issues. What issues do you have? And they're just like talking about it, endure and survive. Oh, like I, that was just really amazing to see. I actually want your thoughts. I was so shocked to see a kid zombie. Yeah. Well, I, I've, there's never been one in the game. And then she's fucking doing weird ass like little twirlings and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know who else was really shocked to see a kid zombie? Joel. Yeah. Building and they show him aiming the sniper rifle to protect Ellie. Yeah. And just he's frozen for a second. Mm-hmm. Because he doesn't want to shoot a little girl. And there's just this really icky moment of gotta pull the trigger, man, it's a zombie. And you can tell Joel. And I love this symmetry. Symmetry is one of my favorite literary devices. In oh, I agree. Mm -hmm. And there's the symmetry of Ellie is being attacked by a little kid who is a zombie. And Joel can't bring himself to pull the trigger. But Henry did pull the trigger. And look what it did to him. You know what I mean? Like that kind of a... Uh, and I don't know. that that little Those little details like that are really worth highlighting. I don't even know what it means. I just know that both Joel and Henry were in a situation where Ellie was being attacked by like a little zombie and they made different choices. And mm. I will leave it, I will leave it to you guys to interpret how, how the show wants you to receive that message. But yeah, I, I know <sighs> that for me, like just seeing that, like how he froze, it was very much like a reminder of the trauma of Sarah. Right? Yes. Like just, I, I can't like, like, he's almost like haunted by that like that event every single time seeing that girl as a zombie like just like you know the reminder of like kids god you know and like ugh, i don't know i just it was weird seeing the kid zombie in this one it was also weird like just seeing like how they move too it was like a very like weird like kiddish like way of doing like just doing like constant like what's it called like uh yes. not somersaults but what is it huh I'd say tumbling is like the yeah cause of tumbling. Just try to get. I was like, oh my god, it's freaky. And see that kid zombie like take out Kathleen too. Like you know what? I think Mark... that has a lot of symbolism behind it too. Oh, how so? I actually never thought about Kathleen's arc there. Yeah. Well, like, well, like, remember when she was talking about her brother and she's like, you know, my brother always said forgiveness and like, and she's she's also reflecting about her childhood and what it felt like to be like that kid. Yeah. And, it's almost like that youthfulness was gone very quickly because obviously yeah. like the last of us and everything. And all I could think about was like how like a kid kind of killed her. Just like oh. you know, those childhood fears are like coming. You know what I mean? Like that kind of parallel, if that makes sense. I might sound confusing. I don't know how to clarify that, but it just seemed a little more symbolic. Just the fact that that little well, kid killed her. I did say kids die, Henry. The whole world doesn't revolve around you. It's like, oh, well, you don't give a shit about kids. Well, yeah, she was a savage. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Sigma male grind set. Like, uh, that, that, that almost had like the moment where it's like, yeah, too bad I had to put that cancer in her brain. Like, you remember that moment yeah. at Guardians? That's what that vibe gave me. Kids die, Henry. What are we going to do? Is that really my fault? Did I put the Kugan infection in? You know, like, the hypocrisy of that. Is that, and I really don't respect Kathleen for this reason. Mm -hmm. She has 
no priorities outside of killing Henry mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And he's the leader of one of the last surviving outposts of humanity in the United States of America. Yeah. Um, and it's just one, of, or I shouldn't even say in the United States, but like in her state, I'll put it this way in her entire state, she's undoubtedly like leading the biggest community settlement of humans. That well, yeah, they took over Fedger, right? Like they're yeah. the entire city of uh, Kansas city. And just, she just, she fails to let, and she even admits it. Like she fails to live up to her brother's ideals and values. Um, and yeah. I just thought how, if I were in her shoes, I think I, I would make a conscious choice to try not to be like Kathleen. Like if I'm ever in a position of, if either of us are either in a position of authority like that, we need to remember a bad role model, like an anti role model out of the Kathleen. Anti <laughs> Kathleen is like the anti uh, leader of, uh, not Fedra. What is it? Like whatever the organization is. Um, Oh man, that's just crazy. Yeah, Kathleen was just twisted as fuck. Yes. God damn. I will say if I did have to critique this episode, I, I mean, other than like what I mentioned earlier about talking, like you know, like I wish I had more time with like Henry and Sam. And I know like that might have been like a direct a directed decision. It just felt like that was a quick episode. You know what I mean? Like they're there and then you turn around and they're gone. They you had no time. Whereas in the game, obviously, we know they had a little more time in there. I just feel like a quick death, you know? My problem with this show is actually, like, how short they are on time, where it's like, The Last of Us is such a good game. Mm -hmm. They only have nine episodes to get through it. And every episode is like, oh, man, they really, like, they got through that as quickly as they could. But also, are they going to have room for the rest of the good stuff in this game? <laughs> like, it's I know. Because really, um, remember when we were talking, we were like, oh, man. I don't like they got time to get to the fall section. <laughs> and then we're like, because you're like, I think they're going to spend two episodes on like Sam and Henry. Fuck, man, we just got to like just one less than that. I feel like I feel like we got less <laughs> like like we got. <clears throat> yeah, we got like um, uh, one episode of Sam and Henry. And then I can tell like I'll, I'm just going to like sort of do a few name drops. Like <laughs> yeah. I think all of the what was the fall section in the game is going to be done in episode six. And like most of the winter section, they're probably going to blend it with winter. And I think I'm a. Uh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Seven is going to probably be winter. Then left behind the DLC is going to be eight. Yeah. And then nine is going to be the final. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. we've we've cracked the code, ladies and gentlemen. I'll ask you a predict a predictive question. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a tough one. Will Joel take on a bloater in this show in the same way he does in the game? I don't think so. See in that fucking thing? Did you see that? It wasn't dying on nothing. I was like, it came out of the fire in the flames. Let's not forget that. It did not come. It came out of the ground in the fire in the flames. It did not die. It just kept going. It had all the bullets tracked on it. Didn't die. I didn't even see a piece of its fungal form come off of itself. It's just fucking a tank. I don't think you like no one can challenge it. I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to spoil, you know, part two of Last of Us. I'm just saying, Caleb, we know that there's a greater monster out there. And if this thing is as powerful, greater monsters out there. Well, yeah, but like, it's just crazy. I'm like, yo, I don't think, like, if, if the bloater is this strong, the next boss that we both know of that's in the next game, there's I no way. I don't even know. Because there's like two bosses in the next game that are both like one of them's harder than a bloater, and then the next one's even harder than that. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, no, I agree. I do hope that they give Joel um, in the game later in Last of Us Part One. Joel does get a flamethrower, um, and I'm hoping that he gets that and he's able. We just get one scene of him fighting a bloater. I don't know. It's a, it's a gamer fantasy. It's, it's going to be probably a moment where like it is. Ellie or like you know it has to be that he has to fight it to save Ellie there is no shot of escaping like he has to yes I think that's what it's going to be it has to it just has to be like that mm. I don't know I'm non non spoiler but future like talk there is a scene where Joel fights a bloater with a chainsaw which no is amazing Oh, oh, don't spoil it. Don't spoil. I know you said not spoil it because it's a teaser trailer, but no, don't do that. I don't watch them for a reason. No, this isn't for this. This is in the game. This is in the game you've played. Hmm? 
You've pl- this is in the games. Joel no, fights not. with a chainsaw. I have never fought one with a chainsaw. Joel and Ellie are going to retrieve a guitar string. I'll tell you that much. That's it. Um, oh, yeah. oh, that's the second game. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. I thought we we're still on the first game. Sorry, yeah. my bad, my bad. I'm just saying in the games he does. He does fight a blood over the chainsaw. It's awesome. And it is pretty epic. I just realized how epic that's. A, in is. the game, it's less epic, but hearing it sounds a lot more epic. <laughs> it's fucking, it's fucking kick ass. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of my favorite shots, maybe in that whole game of just him mm-hmm. taking on the thing with the. Yeah. Anyways, um, especially because he's like sixty in the second game. <laughs> yeah, the sixty year old. He's like, like he's fifty six right now, guys. Take that into consideration. He is fifty six. <laughs> Fighting these zombies, and in four years, he takes one down with a fucking chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, oh. it's pretty fucking kick ass. Hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah, no, th- those are my those are my thoughts on the fourth episode. Yeah, I agree. You know what I noticed though was that when the runners kind of came, they didn't seem as powerful in the sense in the first like compared to the first episode. Did you feel that way? Like they were going down pretty quickly. Like there was just so much of them. They couldn't take them on, but it felt like they were dying fairly quick. Did you think that or no? Uh, I felt like it was a good balance where I like the shot of like all of the zombies emerging, just surrounded by machine guns, hmm. uh, like, like just blasting away and just shredding them. And I think that there was, um, uh, <laughs> cause the thing is compared to the, um, uh, Compared to the game, I think it's getting a pretty good level of similarity in how powerful zombies are. Um, okay. You at one point roasted The Walking Dead for like how badly humanity lost to the zombies. <laughs> We're like, You're damn right. I have a whole topic on that. Let me tell you. We'll get to that in a second, though. Like, because I, I would say, like, playing The Last of Us, I was like, man, humans actually didn't do that bad compared to zombies. Whereas, like, in Walking Dead, it's like everybody big- died. It's like everybody. everybody. <laughs> like no one, no one made it out of this. Um, <laughs> this is okay. I just want to take a brief second. How in the hell do people die in The Walking Dead when you consider the fact they move at a snail's pace? They trip over everything. Do you see anybody who played the Telltale game of Walking Dead? Ever, all of your deaths are basically just like you, like being. Oh, I can't believe it. It's one of them. He's coming towards me and you trip and fall and the zombie takes you out. It is stupid how they take you out. And the fact that nobody lived is ridiculous because the only transmittable thing is through bite. There is no airborne shit. It is bite. So anybody's a Walking Dead fan, I'm sorry, but it's civilization in there is just fucking weak in my opinion. They're just trash. It wouldn't happen to me. Well, let, let's put it this way. In this, there's a good balance where... Yeah. It's not like, how would I put it? It's not like other zombie things where it's just like, you know, um, it's too weak and it's kind of like zombies or something you casually knock out. Like, let's talk, okay, let's just talk for a second about like fantasy zombies. Yeah. Fantasy zombies are like a level one enemy that your character gets at the beginning of the game before he fights any real monsters. Like Dungeons and Dragons where it's like, oh, a zombie, roll greater than three and you chop off its head. Like, yeah. right? Like, it's pretty easy. Or yeah. like in a Zelda game or something where it's like, oh man, I, I haven't been here in a while. The zombies are back. Okay, I'll kill them all. And then, and then you walk through. So they're not that weak, but they're also, um, uh, you're right. It's not like, um, they're not invincible. Like I do like, I, as a kid, I didn't really like zombies as much because they felt kind of OP in a lot of stuff where they're kind of, you can't kill them. They're undead. But it's like, mm-hmm. no, no, you got a gun, like you're, you're, you can blast through these guys. Um, I, I, I think the power level is actually pretty perfect. Okay. Yeah, like, I did feel like, just like they were knocked down very quickly in this one other than the bloater it was just a it was like to me it seemed like there was a lot of massive zombies and that's why Don't they won freeze up on me. oh you okay yeah did i freeze up um, no you didn't it's still playing very smoothly okay you you froze for a second sorry I'm okay like... yeah no worries again it's just like your connection don't worry we're good anyway um it just felt like there was just a lot of mass of the zombie rather than them being too powerful in the uh, earlier episodes you remember where they were taking a lot of shots and they just weren't dying as easily yeah. that's what it felt like it, it was a very huge power difference you could say that that's from you know the years difference maybe one was aged more the body needs to move on or something i don't know but yeah. point is it felt a little less because they had the bloater that was op they just had to rely on a lot of zombies and easily take them out I don't know again if that's because they had a 
automatic weapons, but then Joel had one. You see what I mean? There's like a little bit of difference in like their power level. However, I still think they handled that very well. Now, speaking of like, actually, let's talk about predictions real quick. Okay. What are your predictions for the show? And like, what do you think? How do you think they're going to execute it? And what, you know, just your general thoughts on it. I have gone through my predictions to the greatest level of detail without spoiling the future of the game. Okay. So I am, uh, I will hold my tongue on the predictions. You're going to hold your tongue. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, if I were to comment on it, I am excited to see where this is going to go. I really like how Ellie is almost taking in Joel's grief, like his mentality of grief. And that yeah. he almost, she almost ignores it the same way that he does because she wrote on the little sheet that like, that Sam used and just said, I'm sorry. And walked away. And there was almost a dual meeting for letting him die, but also not staying up with him. Like she promised. But then there's also the, like, she just walks away and it's like, okay, I said West. It was just quick. And that was it. And then Joel's almost stumped by it too. And he puts on his backpack and then just get ready to go. So I think it's interesting how she's taking on a lot of similar principles and mentalities that Joel is. And how Joel's almost shocked and saddened by that. Like, he doesn't want Ellie to grow up like he did. He doesn't want her to take on the same emotional reservedness that he has. And I like that difference. It's showing how he's becoming, like, that protective father figure. Um, and I love what, I'm, I'm very excited to see how they're going to develop that into the next episode. And if we, we, and, we and Kayla both know, fall is very much where they seem very, like, a lot more together and on the same wavelength does that make sense like they're very close and they have a more of a relationship than they did ever before because of the trauma they both exert yes um no you're right you're definitely right uh the other thing to keep in mind is that i i actually won't I, no i will hold my tongue um i will hold my tongue you're gonna hold your tongue okay that's okay so well all this talk about zombies I wanted to get your opinion on I Am Legend, the fantastic Will Smith movie. I can't remember if this was 2007 or 2009 when that came out, because I watched it last week and I didn't actually mind it. Originally, I was like, eh, the movie's kind of garbage. And then I'm like, actually, Will Smith's like, great at acting in that. He slaps the zombies just like he did with Chris. <laughs> My favorite scene in that movie is when there's a scene where he's on the bridge. And he's going to cross over and they have like the scanner machine to see if you're infected or not. And it scans him and it says that he's safe and he's okay to go. Then it scans his wife. And then it shows that she, it comes up negative because she's infected. Mm. And they tell him, they say like, sir, like she's infected. And then he slaps the military man and says, keep my wife. My name. Name. <laughs> fucking mouth. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Um, oh, who added of the bombs being dropped on the on the city and him saying, "Oh, that's hot. Uh, <laughs> that's hot. That's hot." <laughs> no, it's, oh, true, true. Oh man, it's so crazy because Will Smith hasn't been in the news. Well, he had been in the news for a while, but as of recent, he's kind of died in Hollywood at this point. Yes, but oh, that movie—it's really well done and also poorly made at the same time. I don't know how to describe it because. The CGI for the zombies are weird. Like their jaws just don't get, there is no jaw on a zombie. It just awkwardly is elastic. They're like dumb vampires. Yeah, they're zombie. They're not. Dumb. Okay, here's the thing. You keep saying they're dumb. They're not dumb. They're very just tribal, if that makes sense. In that they like, they do design various traps to get, you know, what's, what's Will Smith's character's name? You remember? I think it's Robert. Robert? Yeah, we're going to go with Robert. So, they trap Robert using the mannequin and I didn't realize this until I watched it. Like, he just talks to the mannequins throughout the whole movie because that's a sense of socialization. There is nobody else, so he just talks to mannequins and treats them like they're their own person. He even jokes around a couple of times in the movie just saying well, I'm actually thinking of uh, asking her out. I don't know, I'm a little nervous, but I think I'm going to go for it. And then it's not until his dog dies, he's like, spoiler alert, by the way. He's like, I'd like to go to the, well, to dinner tonight. And it's like, it's so sad. 
Mm. It's so sad because he, he just can't take, he's isolated in that world. So I wouldn't say that they're just dumb. And I had this reflection too. When they use that trap, do you notice they release the, the vampire zombie hounds, but they, the humans, their zombies themselves don't go after him. Oh yeah. They yeah. just did it to just kill the dog and him. They didn't care. They didn't like they could have ensured his death by tracing, but they didn't. Well, I, yeah, they knew what they were doing because he took the the wife, girlfriend, or whatever, the zombie to the main guy in the lead. So <laughs> that he was very much like he's just the leader. There is a sense of hierarchy, and there is smart thinking in that, and they are capable of human interaction as they demonstrate in the alternate ending of that movie where as soon as like will smith opens the door and lets them take back the wife the zombies don't attack him or vampires and that's very much a resemblance of he's the monster not them right well but i uh, would say that they're dumb but yeah you continue i mean mm -hmm. in the book they can talk yes in the book they are like vampire vampires and Maybe I'm, well, yeah, actually, I'm going to make a comparison to another piece of media. In the Castlevania TV show, vampires are like millennia old mass murderers who all of them have complex characters. And even the dumb vampires are still like these seasoned fighters with their own like histories and pasts. Mm -hmm. And I felt like they lost so much of the richness of the book when they took away the dialogue from the vampires, like making them into like, you know, scary noise monsters rather than the monsters that taunted him and teased him and threatened him through his layers of wooden stakes and, you know, boarded up windows in his house felt like it was a lot less interesting. Um, like I, okay. I do feel like him fighting against a bunch of gargling noises is much less impactful than him having his former friends and coworkers out on the street, like, you know, insulting him. Um, that, yes. I haven't read the book, but I've heard that so, someone told me that the movie pales in comparison to the book because the vampires can talk and very much are in the, in the, I'll put it this way in the book. He is the barbarian. He is the savage. He is the monster. And the fact that they talk and he doesn't really talk is just adds that much more to that. It adds that, that, that economy to it. Okay. I do see what you're saying. I think the reason why they did it the way they did is because it's really hard to just say that there are vampires and mass population. And that's the issue. It's because, because they almost in the book, at least to my knowledge, I don't know if there was a virus that made them like a vampire. And that's really hard to try and explain to an audience. Oh yeah. It's a biological vampire. You don't really hear a lot of those or see a lot of those, right? So you have to take in the understanding of the audience. So they changed it to make it zombie because virus and zombie almost go hand in hand. And that there's so many examples in the media, as well as understanding in science, right? That you could develop something that controls them. And that's what's really interesting about the Crippa virus, which I think is a dumb name, by the way. Crippa. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, wait, wait, wait. I, I have a more cynical take. Okay. I think that they changed it to zombies because they wanted to mass market the movie to people. If I'm being honest, because yes. they knew that walking dead was popular and they knew that zombie video games were popular and they knew that the zombies were all the rage and vampires were seen as lame and in teen fan fiction for some reason. Um, yeah. So they just decided <clears throat> we're going to do zombies. We're going to market it that way. It's more palatable. It's kind of like, I know like the executives of like Iron Man two said, Wait, take out the part where Tony Stark's an alcoholic. People don't care about stories. People care about him fighting robots. Or the executives of, I think, Watchmen were pushing for like, wait, take out all the political stuff. Let's make it more of a buddy movie. And mm -hmm. the directors of though both those movies fought with varying degrees of success to keep the the properties as adapting what they, they had intended. And um, uh, I, I think with this, to be honest, they took it out because they wanted to make it more mass marketable. Um, and less of a, cause I don't think the audiences care about realism that much. Like, to be honest, like, I don't, I don't want to see a worse story if it's okay. I, yeah. I do, but here's the thing the, and this ties into, it, it does matter. So there's a difference between palatable and like realism to a degree. See, pe when people watch certain content, there has to be 
the, the construct of the world and the laws that they create need to make sense. If it doesn't, it takes them out of the movie. For example, Horizon Forbidden West. The reason why I struggle to play that game <laughs> is because I know you know about this, is because they'll shoot bow and arrows at fucking machines and it kills them like actual living creatures. It doesn't make sense. If it was adapted, it makes sense, but they're just mechanical. And then the bow and arrow is going to kill them. A wooden bow and arrow. And then some people are like, well, it's a magical bow and arrow. It's like, still, it doesn't make sense. And that took me out of the game. Okay. And by the way, I don't want to get a lot of flack on that. I, if you guys want me to play Forbidden West, I shall. However, my point being here is that the, con the construct of your world makes a difference. If you say, Caleb, vampires were created by a biological weapon. Let's say that. Like, or, make it a or, curse. Just make it a curse. Then. Okay, like but that's the problem. Now you're changing the source material. And that's the point. If you make it a curse, why doesn't he change? It just adds to this, like, fucking, you know, steps, right? Like, how are you going to adapt that? And making it just the Crypto virus makes it better. Because, and I'll explain to you why. First off, the way that they did the Crypto virus is actually really creepy. And it adds to them being more vampiric in a lot of ways. So, for starters, you know that vampires are incredibly strong, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they crave blood, right? Yeah. They hate sunlight. Okay. If we make a virus, how do we make things incredibly strong? Well, that's easy. Let's just make it so that their adrenal glands are always firing. That's what happens. That's why they also can't see well. Like vampires. Like bats. Okay. They made it so their adrenal glands are always going, which dilate the pupils to the point where they need to stay in the dark. Going out in the light, not only can they, they, they barely can see, it burns them to go outside because the pic because remember how their skin like turns entirely to the point where UV rays actually hurt them. And that's the like that can actually happen. There's actually a biological reasoning for that. So now we got two things here. We have the sunlight hurts them. They can't see in the dark. They're super strong because they're like adrenaline's always pumping. Now, obviously we, we both know, like, as fellow colleagues in the scientific world, that having your adrenal glands all the time is going to destroy your fucking liver. Now, I don't know how they survive with that, but it's also like a cure at the same time, because remember how they said that this cure cures everything, and therefore, like, if you give them a dose, it, like, they'll just survive? And that was a neat element, too, is that the show, what, remember how he's trying to cure that female zombie, and she just dies on the table? Yes. He injects her with the virus again, and it brings her back to life. Yes. And that's what's neat. So, okay, there we go. We just took out that, you know, issue with the constant liver thing, whatever. However, my point being is that they actually address each one of those things that a vampire would have, but put it into like a zombie form. So it's more palatable for the audience. It makes sense for the audience. It still takes the, like, the actual conditions of the book. Would you agree with that? Um, I agree with your scientific reasoning mm -hmm. and that there are very strong explanations there. Yep. Um, I will. I just found something I have been listening, but I also found something that might be interesting here. Okay. The origins of the vampires in Matheson's I am legend are also slightly different than those in dark seekers in the, than those of the dark seekers in the movie. In the book, Robert discovers that the source of the disease that turns people into vampires is a germ carried by dust storms and mosquitoes that flags the world in the wake of a recent war's bombings. Oh, okay. The beginning of the book is closer to the alternate cut of I Am Legend, with Robert discovering that some of the infected have been able to resist becoming undead due to mutations in the bacteria and have formed a new society. Um, I personally, this is kind of where it becomes important to me, I guess. I think they can keep a lot of the, like, like you said, like the, the viral side. The only thing that I would want to change is, <clears throat> because it's a movie, give the monsters dialogue. Um, okay. It needs to have that message. And I think it needs to have that, um, uh, when they're characters uh, of their own and they have their own speaking, I think that, or their own, their own messages, I think it really hammers in what the point of the book was. Yes. Um, and I'm also saying that as someone who I think the book was better than the movie, even though I didn't read the book. So like also keep that. In. <laughs> okay. But, I didn't, I didn't read the book either. I, I, I get that. We're just going purely off the movie, which I, I agree. That is a little bit of an issue. 
and that we're commenting on it, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think I, I agree with your point with saying that they need to talk more because it really reinforces the message of the movie. And that's why I also hate the change of the ending, how they just make with you know, Robert just pull the grenade and fucking just commit suicide. I think that's stupid. Yeah. Like and yeah, I don't know. I, I, I do agree with like a lot of those points. I still think they hammered out a lot of the messages though in the same points. And seeing those zombies actually reminded me of my theory that I had a while back with the zombies in The Last of Us. And that it just seems like their adrenal glands are going all the time. And that that's why they're so powerful. And that could also explain why they're so like sensitive to sound and like and sight as well. You know what I mean? Because when you have your adrenaline going, you're paying attention to all of your sensory stimuli. And I think that that's a really interesting detail that maybe the Last of Us show actually incorporates with the cordyceps. Like, what do you think about that? I think that... Okay, not to make things too grim, but have you ever seen clips of people on fentanyl? Yeah. yeah I see it at my work. Yeah, I've, I've, um, I've seen footage of like people in like the city that I live in, and it'll be like a guy. It'll be like a guy driving a car over someone's front lawn, smashing into their house, getting out of the car, running into another person's house. Like, just they're doing the wildest stuff on earth. Like, okay. they're going off the rails. I think that what this does is it's basically now fentanyl isn't a hallucinogen. But like the scientist says in the beginning of the first episode, I think that what the zombie thing does to people is it basically just gives them the wildest fucking hallucinogenics you've ever heard of in your life. Well, that's exactly what happened with the ergot fungi, right? Was that caused delirium hallucinations and incredible aggression. And it just made people go after each other. They didn't know what they were doing. And I think it goes into that's why, like, Sam asks kind of a scary question, which is, you know, are you still inside the monsters? And the answer is probably kind yeah. of like, yeah, you yeah. are. If, if we are going purely off of the parasitic nature of this parasite controlling the host. Okay. We both know that it takes the, it takes over the host. It just kind of goes through them. The host loses control, but they're still there. Yeah. Right. And like, you know, you can, like, that's why, like, we have different medications. However, it's getting, it got to that point where you don't have control of your body anymore. And yes. I think that's the scary thing. And that's why it's, it's really sad to see Sam ask that question because he knows he's turning. And, you know, that's why in the, in the game, once she asks that, she's like, no, I don't think they do. They're not there at all. And that's what makes Sam upset in the game. That's why I like that change in the show, how it's like, you know, I'm not really too sure. You know, it's like there's no, oh, this is to my nose. There wasn't an answer, right? She just said like, right? Yeah, there's not really an answer given in the game. Um, yeah, it's like just kind of a terrifying question. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why I kind of like Tess had the same fear. It's implied when she says, I'm not turning into one of those things in the mm -hmm. game. And it's like, yeah, no, that's fair. Like, I wouldn't want to turn into one of them either. Um, even the military, to a certain extent, is sympathetic when they just, like, kill people who they think are going to get infected, because, like, better you die now than get infected, man. Like, that's just... Well, exactly. Because it raises, like, a, you know, a whole thing, right? Because it's, like, not only do you have to turn into a thing that's just killing your killing machine at this point, and yeah. everything that you know is just gone. And I, I just like you said, it's probably, like, an hallucination of all of your worst fears that you can imagine. And yeah. that's why they're always fighting at everything, right? Yeah. And that's why, like, in The Last of Us Part 2, I really like the detail where, you know, when you kill each zombie, they cry out like a human. They don't cry out like this monster die, like a screech of pain. It is a human screaming for their life. And it's kind of cre creepy to do that. And yeah. it really goes to show the nature of the parasitic relationship that we just mentioned it. Well, cool. yeah. just knowing that it's just, it's kind of a skittish thought, you know? It is. I've never, I've never done any like hallucinogenic drugs before, but I've heard stories of people talk about they can, they can get you to, to, to you know, some pretty far corners of hell. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, it is a, it is a pretty terrifying, to relate to another of my, 
book Watchmen. Watchmen also explored sort of the the dangers of hallucinogenics as weapons. Um, and yeah, no, it's oh, it does. Yeah. Sorry, uh, if you would have like just reminded me as well as the audience because I I can't quite like remember like I know like the, I watched the Watchmen. I I never read the comic and I oh, kind of just like wait, if you could briefly. Oh, you're a casual. Oh, um, oh, I'm the- a casual. Sorry, I watched the Zack Snyder version. As good as that can be. In the book, um, instead of being like a Dr. Manhattan bomb that goes off, what the attack that Ozymandias launched against the human race is, is he launches a massive mutated like squid monster that has like seven eyes and like three tongues and like it's like something out of it's like shit i gotta look this up hold on yeah keep talking keep talking it's like something out of like cthulhu or like a i don't know like a a horror movie oh what the fuck yeah he unleashes this on the human race oh it was involved in the deleted scene oh i didn't know they had a deleted scene in the movie Um, i'm gonna guess so because it's a perfectly rendered like realistic creature that looks identical so they must have shot it for the movie, and then the studio's like, listen, Zach, my man, we're not fucking showing this thing. Who do you think you are, okay? This, is, this isn't this is the Suicide Squad, okay? This isn't... Go, you, who do you think you are? <laughs> who's, the, who's the guy who, who directs Guardians? I forget his name. James uh, Gunn. Do you look like James Gunn, Zach? Are you James? No. You're Zach fucking Snyder. You oh. are going to direct it. Bob. No, no, fucking... Yeah. Um, really a creature. Well, right, I, you know. um, so basically this thing was unleashed and part of its weapons is that it, it kind of like a bloater in the last of us game. It unleashes these horrible spores of just like hallucinogenic projections to the world. Mm-hmm. So anyone within like a hundred miles of one of these things was hit with like the worst, like PTSD inducing drug trip of their life. Um, and uh, must've been yeah. nice to be an experienced drug user then. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, <laughs> Only the drug users survived this. <laughs> like, <laughs> it actually inspired me. This is a bit off topic, but in my sketchbook, okay. I was designing a team of superheroes. Yeah, and I was tired of the fucking like Marvel and DC heroes, where it's like this hero can fly, this hero is really strong, this hero is really strong and can fly. So I made a hero who is based off of like that monster and Mysterio from Marvel, where it just. Uh, her powers is that she can make holograms of anything she wants and hit people with like psychedelic blasts that just like melts their psyche, their psyche. Um, I don't know. It was mm. just a cool, like, I, I like that idea of a weapon. Um, mm. But, but yeah, I know those are anyways, psychedelic weapons are cool kids. That's the, that's the lesson of this. Podcast. Psychedelic weapons are cool. Okay. Actually, like speaking of psychedelics. Um, so I've like taken like a drug course. Okay. Mm-hmm. At my school. And Got a couple uh different documentaries, TED Talks, and different research though about addiction. And I wanted your opinion on this. Because okay. the theory of addiction is that the drug doesn't cause the addiction. It's a it's a psychological and sociological issue. And essentially, their the argument was if you go back to World War II when the sort like and if anybody knows like you know, their history, that was basically the war of drugs. And where, you know, you had suicide bombers going and crashing, like filled up with drugs, so high out of the damn mind, because that gave them the power to do that. German soldiers were pumped up with meth and opiates and everything. It was just that that's what they used. That's why it was the war of drugs. Now, they never got addicted post-war. And the theory behind that, the reason why they didn't, was because what do we know about World War II? What happened afterwards? Everybody was what? Community. Community was heavy. That's when the baby boom happened. Everybody yes. was together. So there was this great social connectedness. Now, if anybody studied Durkheim and the understanding of suicide, his whole research was dedicated to the fact that it's very important, like, unlike psychology that just focuses on mental disorders and just say, oh, it's depression that does it. They focus on the fact that it's the normlessness and in the individual's inability to be connected to society that causes them to have depression and commit suicide. And he said it was too much individualism. That's how he described it. And I thought this was really interesting as well, like in this research, 
and that they said that it's too much isolation that causes the withdrawal of society. And there was a study that was done where I think it was Brazil or something where they had a really bad drug problem. They legalized all drugs and found that was a big issue. That didn't cause their drug issue to go down. What did, though, was that they took the money they would have spent, you know, um, into like the drug cost area and then put it into re um, connecting them to society. Mm. And that eliminated so much of the drug problem that they had. And it just made me wonder is it that we, we look at addiction? wrong and should we reevaluate it yes however i think you're taking it too far oh i'm not i'm just saying i'm just saying this based on the re i'm not saying oh. like like that i didn't necessarily believe it wholeheartedly i have my own skepticism as well. i think that <clears throat> to ask whether or not an addiction stems from the chemical effects of the drug or the hmm. circumstances of the individual is sort of like asking whether or not a footprint is caused by the hardness of a boot or the softness of the mud. It's 100% both. Like, you know, they kind of both need to be mm -hmm. there in a sense. Um, and it's not like, well, 50% of the footprint is because the boot is hard. It's like, no, no, it's just, it, just that, that's how it's both mm -hmm. of these things. Um, I think that taking drugs, um, <laughs> heck, even personally, <laughs> someone who just, just dry, chugged down some whiskey right now, um, Mm -hmm. I think taking drugs stems from <clears throat> it's usually going to give people some kind of chemical shortcut to a deficit that they're already experiencing in some way. Um, for example, like people who lack focus are going to take Adderall and are more likely to have an Adderall dependency. Um, people with a lot of stress are likely to delve into alcoholism because alcohol is something that can sort of like you know give you that that sort of exhale yeah, it, it, it can't provide you with that sense of relief yeah it's and, and, on, and on the note of what you're talking about if people mm -hmm. are isolated from their communities um as we saw even like joel in the first episode of the last of us tv show that we we both adore um oxycontin is a drug that as far as i know releases huge amounts of serotonin so the kind of problem that you're talking about what i think apply especially well to oxycontin um, where some where someone feels really isolated or disconnect from other people or lacks human verbal or physical contact, um, that seems to be the drug that can take wind of them. And in the real world, we see that in communities that are ravaged by unemployment. Like mm -hmm. you know, the Midwest and the Rust Belt of the United States, places where the factories moved away to other countries and where you know the jobs are down, or even I think out on the, the East Coast, where I'm uh, we see these communities sort of broken apart by economic downturns uh, that sort of divides people where, you know, the young people move away and all the old folks just live on unemployment. Mm -hmm. Those are places where, yeah, a lot of drugs tend to find their prey. And I think it speaks to, yeah. I, I don't think you're, I don't think the theory you bring forward completely explains it because um, for example, like you can absolutely get addicted to drugs, even if you have strong. Okay, community well, I, I just um, want to make it, I just want to make it clear. I'm not saying that there is no chemical like component to it. There is very much so. For example, one of the things that makes opioids so addicting is the is that like the, it releases the endorphins. So when you like take them, the whole theory that I'm getting behind is that for people that experience a detachment of love, they did not get a lot of love in their childhood. They experienced a lot of trauma, and they were separated a lot of the time. They usually find the addiction in the opioids because they describe it as a warm hug because that's what the endorphin receptors in. It's not those releases. It's like the endorphins. It triggers the love receptors, very similar to like feeling love from another and that warm connection. Well, if you actually look at the brain activity from getting a hug from somebody you truly love and taking opioids, it's it triggers the same regions of the brain. Mm. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that it doesn't trigger any chemical reaction because I'm just saying, like, look at gambling, right? You know how there's gambling addiction? Well, you couldn't, you, you know, just to say, like, it's just a chemical, you know, there's no drug being taken that's causing that. It's the fact that when you gamble, there's, like, it releases the dopamine. There's that motivation section of the brain. Without dopamine, there is no motivation. There was a whole study where they took out the dopamine receptors in rats, and they put food just an inch away from their mouth and saw what they did, and they starved to death. 
So unless they're directly feeding it, they would die. And the whole point is that there is no motivation without dopamine. And the whole point is that if you have something that's consistently triggering that dopamine receptor, all your motivation is dedicated to that. The withdrawal of that causes you to feel that motivation to get it back. It's this endless paradoxal cycle, right? And that's what I'm getting at. I think it's a mixture between there is a sociological aspect and those sociological slash traumas and that exist from your childhood. Drugs provide a release as well as like a fulfillment of that emptiness. That's what I'm getting at. And I think that's an interesting relationship. And it's sad that, you know, in politics and that they don't go to like the like actual research that's demonstrated this so many times. I mean, just look at like cannabis. There's like, you know, it was just legalized in Canada in what, 2017, 2018? Yeah. And in America, it's still banned in a lot of states. And that, and just by the way, everybody, I just want to make it clear. Cannabis does not, is not as like bad as like the U S makes it. It's purely just caused because of biases and historical accounts. There was like books that were written that try to say, you know, black people on cannabis kill, like there was some racist shit. Uh, they use it just to in- incarcerate like African Americans. That was the, that was the main reason. Yes. Because it's st- it went from China where marijuana came and it went down to the New Orleans and then they were just like, "Oh, they're going to cause you know our white daughters to like go out of hand and fucking I don't know what's the oh have babies oh my god they turn into the devil they like sex oh my god it's just like that that was their belief and a lot of it's historically accounted for and even look at Stephen Harper you know he actually did not use the medical board and got his own branch a scientist quote unquote to fucking like do research and then we're like haha it's bad for you therefore we're going to do the safety street acts and now we can talk about Marx being you know and how he would say well of course they're going to do that they're going to take advantage or they're going to like take the real issues of society and push it over onto something else as a distraction yes so the problem for everything not the economic recession that's happening it's the drugs that's causing it yeah right? and sorry I went off on a little bit of a tangent there but that's that was just my understanding, and I was just curious. Do you think there needs to be a reevaluation of drugs entirely? Do you think there needs to be a significant reform and alterations within the current drug laws? And not only Canada, but just like Nash, like internationally as well. Well, I just believe that ethically, if people would like to take drugs, they should have the right to. Yeah, because libertarian. The, the yeah. Sovereignty of, yeah, just the sovereignty of individuals. Hmm. I also believe not just in the sovereignty of individuals, but also the value. Value is not even a strong enough word. Mm -hmm. Necessity is not even a strong enough word. Just the amount, the pricelessness of community bonds, I'll say, where I do truly think that the best weapon we have against a drug epidemic is a strong community unit. Um, And I'm going to sound like a boomer right now, but I'm... Uh Uh-oh. So... (laughs) families churches mosques whatever it is that brings people together and brings that sort of glue of the community can be incredibly important because mm-hmm. sometimes for a lot of people you know the, what's going to stop them from you know choking back one too many shots of vodka is their friend or family member saying hey we care about you don't do this and that, that's mm-hmm. enough to stop them um or in a lot of situations people wouldn't even consider turning to these sort of you know either these sort of numbing agents in, in the depressants that will sort of, you know, turn their brain off so they don't have to think about their problems. Or on the other hand, these what I'll call like the warming agents of the the drugs that sort of make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they just had someone to reach out to and talk to about these things. So I think I'm a, yeah, no, the, the best, um, if you want to, the, the real source we need to be going to on the war against drug epidemics is like the, Unironically, like Care Bears and My Little Pony, like though, like I'm not, I'm not even joking. Like the oh. lesson about, like no, because the solution to every problem in Care Bears is that they need to care about each other more. Um, like every yeah. episode ends with like, and then they all hugged, and the dragon of hate died. Like that's always what it is. Sorry, I just like a Dave uh, Chappelle where it's like, 
And these guys, they would just say, they would see the problem and they would just show so much care and shoot care and love out of their chest and defeat the problem. Yes. They would just say, we got to do the care bear stare. <laughs> and then they would just eliminate the problem with so much care, so much bundle up inside of them. They eliminated the problem. Actually, that, see, sorry, you go, you go, you go. I'll say, <coughs> unironically, and this is an important note. If anyone out there is thinking of having kids soon, I cannot stress enough. It seems like a strange prescription to make from a <laughs> podcast that spent an hour talking about slaughtering zombies. And well, slaughter. Well, hold on, let's go. We need to talk about slaughtering zombies, and then we talked about different viruses, and now we're talking about drugs and addiction. <laughs> side tangent the my little pony friendship is magic tv show i don't know why it popped into my head but unironically it teaches like every good lesson about fucking friendship you could ever hear like every episode is like my little pony and care bears are the solution that this world needs no even i bring those up (laughs) because they're just sort of the obvious examples but yeah like real like i read an article today in the guardian weekly that said that um what was it it was like 4,500 churches in the United States shut down last year and only yeah. 3,000 new ones opened because just there's a lack of belief among young people, amongst young people and people have lost a lot of faith in the church. And I'm conflicted because I see on the one hand that, you know, the church has done a lot of evil stuff. And I, I don't think a lot of what they say is historically or scientifically true, if I'm, if I'm just being honest. But on the other hand, it is saddening to see that in the West that we're seeing all of these community centers die off. And then all of these like drugs and addictions kind of fill that void. And I'm seeing some of the stats about, yeah, like the statistics about the number of people who claim to be introverts versus what the number of people in your society that like naturally should be claiming to be introverts, Mm -hmm. things like that, or just the the number of people that report being lonely. Uh, It's really, it's really tragic, and I do think it, it has a strong causative effect on the drug outbreaks that we're seeing in Canada and the U.S. Well, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, especially like if you look at the like statistics with like depression that are just going like anxiety among adolescents these days are astronomical, you know, and the amount of like teenage suicide. It's it's quite saddening to see like and it's it's hard to state whether or not. Because I know we mentioned like care bears, like, you know, learning development to like just carry, but our world has gotten a lot darker post 9 11. Like, we see death almost daily on like the news, and like we see it so much, we become, uh, it's normalized now. We become numb to it. And I think that's kind of sad where we're just gotten to the point that it's just nothing to us. And I think that's like, a key thing that we need to look at and kind of evaluate, kind of find a baby. Like, and, you know, obviously, I don't know about Care Bears as to be the, the solution to baby like that problem. <laughs> and just, My Little Pony. You've probably heard that the most valuable lessons in life come in kindergarten. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, kindergarten didn't teach me how to program or, you know, doesn't teach you how to fix your bicycle or whatever. It doesn't teach you how to write a report on a scientific topic. It does kind of teach those things of like, yeah, like <laughs> reaching out to your community. Um, mm. And there's many ways that, that, you know, there's many ways that can take form. Um, it can be, um, there's a thousand places. It can be in hobbies, sports, religious institutions, family, friends. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, like institutions, like, like, you know, even like my drug course, we talked about like how just like being in like a lot of different like institutions, programs can actually like divert you from like doing drugs because it takes up the time aspect i forget what the exact model was be- it just combined the fact that you know there's like a time there's opportunity there's uh like who you surround yourself with as well as your actual beliefs and morals and principles on drugs as well that like change your like your probability of enacting in that however like something that like i think about when i hear like a, a, the institutions because i go back all the way to like the, the, the drug laws again and how they identify drugs as a moral problem that it's a compromisable act on itself. And, you know, when you're talking about, like, the development of kids and, like, how, like, it's being altered based on what we consume, as well as, like, drugs being more of a moral problem, I actually wanted to get into the conversation on morality. 
Okay. You know, like a, a very philosophical change in conversation. And I, I was like learning in class about Kohlberg and he developed, you know, this, this model of moral development and where he talked about, there's like a pre-conventional stage where there's obedience, just, you know, own sake and serving you know, your own interests. Then we move on to the conventional stage following the rules and norms of society. However, what's really interesting is very few people get to the post-conventional stage, which is the commitment to self-chosen moral ethic principles and a prior to society. And essentially, to kind of conclude that, that very thought, is that we serve society the greater of mankind. Okay? Very few people get to that stage. And it made me question, you know, to what degree... Is that a reason? Like, uh, is that like the pureness of morality, the eventual stage, the eventual development? Because there's a put, there's like actually a great classic example where there was a doctor that developed a cure for this, you know, out of this very limited resource. This woman very, like, needed it. She wasn't able to afford it because the pharmacist jacked up the price. As we've known in history, look at the fucking like AIDS, like, you know, medicine. Yes. Happened with pharma. Now, this wife's like this girl, like her, like, you know, she's a wife and her husband decides to break into the pharmacy and steal this drug and gives it to her. <clears throat> now, the huge question is, was this morally correct? And a lot of people try to say, yes, it is morally correct. And some people said, no, because you're taking the resources away from others. Now, Caleb, I want to ask the question to you. To what point is the personal connection with somebody else? justify the like taking away that access for the greater of mankind to what degree is this morally acceptable what are your thoughts on that it's a good question i think that i'm a strong believer in a moral i'd say gradient um and what i mean by the gradient um i'm thinking of a photoshop gradient where you sort of have a really really <laughs> light at the center and then it sort of fades off it's like yeah. a circle except there's no line at the edge of it it just sort of slowly fades off it's like i'm a, i don't know i don't know what you compare it to um but i'll say that i do think that people should take care of themselves but what is you and what constitutes your reality sort of fades off and fades in depending on like yourself isn't just you Yourself mm -hmm. also, in a sense, includes your close relationships with your friends and family. It isn't just two arms, a head, a torso, and legs. Um, you know, he's also nested in his friendships and in his... Um, also, oh, fuck, I just dropped your full name. Oh, did you? That's fine. I keep going. That's okay. I'll bleep it out. I'll yeah, find a way. Bleep it out. Awesome. Um, good Good to have your, your tech expertise here. Um but also adding on to that, um, yeah, like you're also nested in your community in a sense. Um, you are a member of a place of some kind, <laughs> keeping it bad <laughs> now, um, and a member of a country. Um, and then after that, you're a member of the human race. And then you're also a member of the mammal class, which is the, I'd say, the broadest level of community that mm -hmm. you know, think about it so broad. But at that level, it kind of comes down to just allegiance. Um or yeah, I do think fundamentally people have a duty to take care of themselves and their family, but they also have a, a duty on top of that to a lesser degree, but on top of that to take care of their community and then, you know, to be loyal to their country and then to their, um, uh, yeah. And then just sort of, just sort of working out towards those outer, those outer layers and um, uh, the exact questions of what to prioritize when I can't say I have all the answers. I can't even say what I would do in, in all these situations, Mm -hmm. uh, like I've even asked questions like, um, uh, if this is, this is a, a kind of a silly one, but no, it's not silly. I think it's a, a real question of like, if, if an enemy, if an invading force was marching into my country and a human being was going to kill my dog, mm -hmm. would you kill another human being to save your dog. And it comes to one of the things where it's like, well, like, what are you close to? Right? Like, what's your duty to, is it to, protecting human life or is it to this dog that you have this relationship with um hmm. there questions about the the um, uh, the drug i'd say i would probably break into the place and take the drug 
Um, because first and foremost, I would see myself as a husband before I saw myself as a Canadian. And Canadians are bound by Canadian laws, but I would be more bound by my marriage vows. That's but if we I- were take if we took out the like that though, like okay, so like because you're saying like it's the it's the social role of the husband, yes, right? protecting the wife. Mm-hmm. If we were to take that aspect out, okay, let's say that, um. But let's take that out of the scenario instead of it just being like the role of a husband. Okay. Let's just like, let's make it a family member. Let's say, how does that alter the situation? I don't think it alters it much. Cause it would just be the role of an older brother or of a father or of a daughter. Like, a, uh, but, but does that make it morally acceptable though, to like break into it, into like a pharmacy? Okay. Now this is a limited resource with very limited amount of medicine to spread around, which is why the cost of it is so high. In, Does that make it morally justifiable to take that resource away from everybody? If we were to take that your relationship to this other person, okay, let's okay, let's go back to the wife example. Then. The argument that you're making is that because you have the social obligation that that's your relationship with this person, they are your wife. If we make it abstract, you're trying to say that your experiences and your time and and your like building of identity with this person is therefore making it morally acceptable yeah. to take this resource away from other people who have their own sense of experiences and understandings with those people and their own formation of identity. And therefore your, your experiences are make it more acceptable for you to do it than others who have taken their time to do, diligently wait and save and actually purchase I mean, care. As, as bleak as it, as it is, I'd say, yes, I'd say you do have that, um, uh, that relationship that you have to honor. And the reason I work it out is that I'm, uh, and I, I've had lots of discussions about this and I've sort of thought about it where on some level, humans do have to kind of be loyal to their own. And I bring up that gradient of, sort of yourself, your wife, your community, your country, your species, your class, but class in this means it's biological class. Um, Hmm. It seems like I'm I'm just adding endless layers of, you know, endless layers of complexity to it, but it really is relevant where, um, yeah, like if if I'm walking through the the wilderness and I see a human fighting with a wolf, I'm going to take the human side because the human is on... Frankly, and it's not because wolves are objectively bad. It's just sort of I see it as humans are more. I have a duty to help fellow humans before I do to help this. this okay, person. so and okay, or- so there's almost a, for you. It's very much dependent on the context. You will help a stranger if that <laughs> is an fighting off an animal. But what about a human? What if two humans are fighting to the death? Well, that's that's where it gets into, and I bring back the gradient where if two humans are fighting to the death. And it's whatever. Would it be like that guy on Godzilla and say, let them fight? No. (laughs) It would be funny if I was, but um, (laughs) I break it down to, well, let's say like I'll bring by the soldiers example. Like if there's a war between Canada and Russia, um, I'd boil it down to, okay, it's humans fighting humans, but I'm loyal to Canada, my country before Russia. And if there are men in Russia who feel the, that they're honor bound to fight for their country, then Godspeed to them, but I'm not them. I'm, I am Caleb the Canadian. And if you you sort of work in back, and you I didn't work- put your full name there. No, just joking. <laughs> like, yeah, just I, just, I know. Um, yeah, don't make that mistake. You know, uh, just joking. It's like- I see it, and I bring it back. Actually, I've been thinking a lot about like Confucianism. Actually, has this this moral system where, um, it's interesting. It's an interesting way of sort of breaking down morality, but it is a very rules based morality of when you're deciding what to do you don't follow one book of the objective rules of what like you have to do the 10 commandments um, hmm. the same way the Judeo Christian morality is what it breaks it down is into, there are the five key relationships. And one of them is the relationship between a person and their country. One of them is the relationship between like a sibling, like a brother and a brother. Another one is between a husband and a wife. And it's, it, you get the hmm. idea. And I'm just sort of asks, you know, when you're going to make these decisions, you have to make the, you have to ask yourself the questions of, yeah. And this question, this guy who stole the medicine, he's asking, well, what makes, he asked what makes a good Canadian and a good Canadian does not break into a pharmacy and steal medicine. And then he asks, what is a good husband? 
And a good husband makes sure that his wife. But did he ask his wife? That's the question. Well, what if she didn't agree with it? Um, if she didn't, what if she says no and he did it anyway? So now he's not a longer a good husband. Okay, that's pushing it for. I would actually say that no, it's no longer a ma. That that that, that is actually the next point of dialogue too, because it, it actually expands on all of these morally gray areas. And I think and that, that <coughs> honestly, because now uh, he's speaking, now he's doing it selfishly. I would say that now um, that actually breaks it down where he shouldn't do that. Um, but either way, he's acting out of selfishness. He's stealing from others and he's stealing for his wife to make sure she lives longer. That is selfish in itself. If she's accepted death and he went and took it anyway and put it, that as his job. Yes, it is selfish. That is selfish. Yes. yes. Because no matter what, like the whole point, because like that's the thing, like she, she tried to find different payment methods and she couldn't. She accepted it. <clears throat> He was the one who went out. So now we get into, okay, you know, what about, like, so is he guilty then? So, because that's the next point of dialogue. He's, he's taken the court and they go to court and then it's like, well, is he guilty? And, yes. do you, and if he is, do you think he should get a sentence for it? Yes. So you do agree with that. Why? Because it's the court's job to have their loyal. And again, this is the question of loyalties. This isn't an objective morality. It's a loyalty-based, context-based morality. A judge's job is to put Canada's interests first. A husband's job is to put his wife's interests first. So if I were the husband, I'd be still in that medicine. If I were the judge, I would be sending him to jail. Mm. Because whoever you are, it's like the it's like the it's the question in above of two soldiers fighting where um it's it's you go onto the battlefield and you see that there's someone else, a young man just like you holding his gun, marching into battle. And you recognize if I was born in his country, I would be fighting for his side and I would be fighting against my country. But I wasn't born in his country. OK, OK, let me add some complexity to the situation. Mm -hmm. The judge who's having to do the sentence. <clears throat> now, jury rules that he should go to. Of how egregious they were. Wait, the death penalty for stealing medicine? That doesn't seem like... No, you got to keep in mind, like, this is, like, a, a scarce medicine. This is, like, new... Like, this is very limited medicine. Very rare disease. And let's just, let's just say an example. We're saying hypotheticals, okay? We're saying hypotheticals, okay? The judge is the... This guy's father. Now we're getting more complex. And he decides... Doesn't want to necessarily send him to the death penalty... Instead, wants to just say, listen, it's a slap on the wrist. You're guilty, but we're not going to put a sentence. Wait, he's guilty, but do you mean that literally? He literally. I mean, like, is he literally getting nothing but a slap on the wrist for what he did? No, 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 no. Like, as in, like, no, like, you are, we're going to say that you're guilty, but we're going to, like, let this off as a warning. Okay. And he decides to do that route. It's a. He didn't even get slapped on the wrist. You think it's slipped to the... No, there's no physical... You <laughs> <laughs> was going to get slapped in the wrist. Um, <laughs> okay, still still a, a good question. I, I would say I don't quite know at that point because here's the thing. If you swear to be a judge, mm -hmm. which I would, not, I would not make that promise, <clears throat> but if you swear on to be a judge, you have made a promise to what I see is your society that you will put the interests of that constitution and that society above any other commitments you have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a judge, you have made marriage vows to the state. <laughs> That's a very weird way of putting it, but well, well, yeah, exactly. You made that promise, but yeah. like the whole point is that do you there defy the state because of your own think, personal the, connections and relationships? I think the judge, to be honest, has a ma uh, judge made a deal with the state and he kind of sold and sold the constitution. At that point. And I'd say mm -hmm. I'm, a, <clears throat> I'm not a judge and I would never be one. But um, yeah, I think he's got to send his, his little boy to the chair. Um, oh. <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, just the way you said that. He's got to send his little boy to the chair. Like, oh, God. But sorry, like, it's just one of those things where I'm, uh, yeah, like, I am. Uh, <clears throat> and I've had, the, it's a relevant question, but it's, it's just, yeah, I think that's. I think I've given. Was a, no, it was a good answer. It was a good answer. 
And there's a lot of different opinions. Like I know for the class, I usually I would be like, no, there's a moral. Th I would agree to like to a degree because all I could think about was like various stories that I've heard. I'm not going to spoil any story together about like where like you could argue either side. And I actually took the opposite side. I just said, no, he's guilty. The law of the state. That's what they declared. And either way, you're taking away the resources from everybody else. And then I argued, no, same punishment exists for everybody. There is no getaways. That is the deal. And I was a very much like co-calculated. A legalist, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and like that's what I did because I could prove every argument, but it's really hard to prove something. And this is where I feel like it's interesting. Everybody struggles with the sense of morality, this exact situation of putting your family, like you know, the, the, the family versus the law and what's fair and just of everybody. And everybody has this innate instinct for the relationship. And that almost makes me think like, that's just really weird how humans, they all feel this way, but none of them agree that that's fair. You see what I'm saying? It's an interesting thought about humans in society. And I was, I don't know if you feel the same way. Yeah, I mean, it's just a question of loyalty, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you see as a more important loyalty? The loyalty to your, I, mean, I keep using the word country, but it seems like the same. Yeah, yeah you could say country, state, whatever. <laughs> like, society. We'll just say society as a whole, civilization, like, whatever. On the one end, I know that like medieval samurai, when their lords would test their loyalty, they would say, <clears throat> first of all, I'm sure you know, if a samurai failed his master, he would kill himself. That was the mandate of seppuku. Um, and I know yeah. that the shoguns and the lords at the time, the Jito, would casually order a samurai. It's like, go kill your wife and children right now to prove your loyalty to me. Then the samurai would go home and do it. And it was just like a, ooh. Damn. Woo. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, that's a tough topic. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And it would, I'm just bringing that up because that's like legitimately the very extreme people who are purely loyal to the state. And not to say that the guy not stealing the medicine would be that bad, but I still, but I'm not very, very much of like a mechanic solidarity. aspect. Yeah. Um, I, I would not be that samurai. <laughs> I hope Fair enough. I would. agree. Me neither. Um, and I think on the opposite extreme, which is probably where I would lean, like um, if my daughter or my father or my sister or my mother were in a situation where they needed a medicine to live, I would just ask myself, it's like, well, who am I going to look in the mirror at the end of today? Am I going to look at a good son or am I going to look at a good Canadian? And mm. then I'd probably be looking at a good son. Like, that's just kind of the, that's and, my, yeah, that, and that, that, that's a fair, like, you know, like uh, understanding or like opinion on morality. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think the last uh, topic that we're going to cover, mm -hmm. and it kind of ties in a little bit of everything actually that we talked about. I didn't mean to, but like, is the idea of chat GPT, you know, this understanding of what's right. And I know that a lot of universities, including my own, have been panicking because ChatGPT is this amazing AI in which you can get them to write on any topic, right? And that's what's amazing and how they're getting this device to actually write out full on papers and essays and there's no way to track it. And now they're trying to say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's ethically wrong if like students cheat and then they do that, then there's opinions. Like, you know, some argue that, well, you, may, you monetize their entire system of learning to the point of where they feel like it's this way or nothing. And that yes, hard work does pay off, but the importance of that degree and some people feel like it's necessary to cheat to do that because there's no other way to achieve like any financial success post without those higher degrees because they're implemented in all the career sectors. And I was curious, not only like of your opinion on that, but your overall like, you know, opinion on chat GPT as itself. AI. I refuse to use chat GPT as a cheating device. Me too. Um, <clears throat> I was writing an email today mm. and just as a test, I thought, okay, what if I gave this prompt and I described the email I want to write to chat GPT and then I got it to write it for me and then I wrote it out and then I sent that to my great grandfather instead. I thought about it and I typed it in <clears throat> and it spat out the email and then I ignored it and I went and I just, moved on with my day. And when I respond to them, I'm going to write my own email because I want my messages to my great grandfather to, 
to be authentically mine. Um, mm. Just like I want this conversation with you right now to be authentically ours. Yeah. And I want my education to be something that I had my, um, uh, my name written on. It's like the, it's like the, do you know the Frank Sinatra song, My Way? Um, by chance, have you a heard A little that? bit. You might have to like sing it a little bit or hum it. Um, uh, uh, basically, it's it's like one of his classic jazz songs, but when it builds up to the chorus every time, it says, and I drove every highway, I did it all, and I did it my way. Oh, my, okay, yeah, I do remember that now. Okay, yeah, yeah. And it's a good song because it's him talking about all of his pain in life, his heartbreaks and his failures. Um, but it always comes back to the sense of joy and pride of him saying. Joy and pride of him being himself my way. Yeah. And, and in the ending, it says, you know, you know, for what is a man if not himself? And they had it. I don't want to sing the whole song, but just it's leaning into it's the passion. Um, <laughs> no copyright. We're good. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. But there's um, uh, there's a pride to that of. Like, I want to submit assignments that are mine. And I showed up to this university. I made a deal with other people. I paid money. And I made an agreement that I would honestly get my education, get my certificate honestly. And my professors, they're not some cold calculating money machines. They're human beings who spend... They're human beings who spend a good amount of their time uh, out of every day making sure that I get the learning that I need. And they go above and beyond a lot of cases to make sure that students get are able to learn what they want to learn. And I do think they're honest on their end that they don't just cheap out and do whatever gets in their paycheck. They actually make sure that the students they teach actually can learn as much as they need to from their courses and, uh-huh. and, and give you the extra help you need. And the other side of that is that I'm not here to cheat them. I'm, I'm here to actually learn things and I'm here to uphold my end of the bargain. So yeah, I am a, I will not be cheating with ChatGPT, and I will judge people who do cheat with ChatGPT. Hmm. Oh, by yeah. the way, I, I want to make it very clear. I'm not condoning cheating at, at, at any sense or saying that it's right. It doesn't sound like that. No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, there, there's, like, a really interesting, like, argument that a lot of people are making towards that. Personally, I agree with a lot of the points. I don't think cheating is good at all. Because here's the thing. <coughs> we have very limited time on this earth. Okay, and this is going to sound cheesy a little bit, but when we go and like pursue education, what is the point of education? It's yeah, we're learning, but it's to develop ourselves into the you know the next stage of our lives. And if we're just trying to get an easy pass by by living inauthentically, like you even suggested, what the fuck's the point? Why don't you just throw your hundred thousand dollar loan away and just fucking like go go and do whatever you want and fake your entire life out? This is yeah. the problem. Is that you're not getting anything out of cheating. No. It's just to, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just like, you just don't want to do the work. Or, you know, you don't yeah. want to do it. Like there are some people that are like struggling. They're like, oh, but the stress is, it's like, I can't do it. I try my best and stuff. Well, I'm sorry, but you got to like access those resources that are available to well, you. Part of it, I will admit, and it's mm-hmm. really difficult, is time. The time is difficult. If, if like, because I mean, yes, I have a, uh, squirted the lines on some quizzes in the past because it was something worth like screw it i don't have 12 hours to study for this thing we gotta just do it right like right yeah. then before and, and those are different because i i have more, more chat gpt i'm thinking about like my writings and essays and stuff but yeah sometimes whatever you're in some like i'm not gonna name a course but like you're in some course we're just gonna quiz you on a bunch of math bullshit and you have four other subjects that you're in plus your friends want you to hang out on friday plus mm-hmm. You have chores and you have to do grocery shopping, you have to do laundry and just becomes, you know what, am I going to spend the eight hours to feel like a good person? So I do get like, okay, whatever. Maybe those math questions weren't necessarily the most honest, but hmm. uh, on the other hand, it's like chat GPT, I think like, yeah, I don't know. I, I still don't want to just replace, I, I still like broadly the courses I'm taking, I want to genuinely learn from. So hmm. I will be staying away from chat GPT. Yeah, I I agree. I think that ChatGPT is really like in, like you know it is a very cool device, and I think just like you said, you can ask philosophical questions, and it's a really neat dialogue. It you know you can learn a lot through ChatGPT because in that form of conversation, because that's how we learn a lot of the time. There's this idea of like th- like a thesis, antithesis, and 
combine together, create synthesis, right? Yeah. Every interaction, we get something new from it. So that's how, like, you know, I get, like, the really cool elements of ChatGPT and trying to develop, you know, yourself and your own knowledge. However, I think to use that as, like, a scapegoat and, like, you know, just to get things done because you don't want to put the effort in, I think that's really unfortunate and a lot. <laughs> However, you know, if universities are worried about this, because I know you said that, you know, you've had a lot of great experiences with professors. You know, unfortunately for me, I haven't had, like, you know, that similar success. I have had a lot of professors, how they teach the courses is very rushed, jot notes. They don't care because they're there to, like, go and do their research, right? There are professors like that, and it's unfortunate. However, when you get really, really good ones, they encourage you to be better, to do better. And when you put the work in, it is a it is a changing experience for a lot of people. And I think it's unfortunate. And I hope that maybe universities will take a second to look back and maybe redevelop their own programs to make it like you were saying. They are evolved. They take the time for the learn and they try to make it so it's not just marks or nothing. You know what I mean? There's a like the, maybe they need to change that format of it. Because as soon as you make it marks, you you take away the actual learning element. And just make it so it's statistical, you know. Two way street. It is a two way street. Hmm. Yes, I agree. It is something where professors and students both have a covenant of having to uphold the mission of learning rather than being cheap and exploitative. I, I agree with that. Yeah, and again, you know, it just really rings out. You know, that idea of like you know, great power comes great responsibility. Hopefully, yes, I'm able to you know hold that too. But you, you did you did ask also for my broader thoughts on ChatGPT. Yeah, no worries. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read out, just to give the audience a sense of what this technology is, because we didn't do a very good job earlier of introducing, we sort of assumed- Oh, sorry. Knew. Yeah, yeah. We, we assumed you guys knew. Yeah. Um, but ChatGPT is a new artificial intelligence that is marveling the world with how just truly incredible it is at responding in human text conversations. I'm going to read a few examples to you of my interactions and logs with ChatGPT, just to show the depth of it. <clears throat> I asked it a riddle where I said, here's a riddle you might find difficult. I might come in through the window. I'm often at a bar. I'm used to send your children to die in lands afar. What am I? ChatGPT took a moment to load it, but it's responded, the answer to this riddle is a draft. A draft is used to send soldiers, your children, to fight in wars, lands afar. It also refers to a draft of air that comes through a window, and also a draft is a term used in bars to pull beer from a keg using a handle. That's pretty impressive. I mean, it's not connected to the internet, so it's not cheating. It solved the riddle. Like, it actually... Wait, shit, it's not connected to the internet? It's connected to a database, but I like with these kinds of things, like it doesn't solve riddles by just looking it up. Okay. Um, it solves riddles by, like, crunching them. Um, like it actually thought about this for a, a few seconds and then had the answer and explained it. Um, hmm. Can you write a haiku about sleeping on the moon? A second later, I get a response. Silent lunar night. Dreams drift in weightless sleep. Earth's glow far away. And I'm like, okay, I guess you're writing poetry now, pal. Um, the I, I asked it, okay, here's a question that'll really blow your mind. <clears throat> I asked ChatGPT, if I built a bridge that stretched around the entire earth and connected it back unto itself, and I ensured that every piece of that bridge weighed the same amount and was equally far from the ground, what would happen if I destroyed all of the supports? So think about it. It's a cool question, right? Because the bridge theoretically- well, because, because the compression of everything together would make it stay still. Yes, it would float. Yes, yeah, yes, it would float. So I asked her the question, yeah, yeah. is ChatGPT smart enough to know- You mad, man. To think about it. <laughs> It's just, it is difficult to say for certain what would happen if you destroyed all the supports on a bridge that stretched around the entire Earth and connections back unto itself, as there are many factors that would come into play. Some possible outcomes could include the bridge collapsing and falling to the ground, or the bridge remaining in place and continuing to support itself due to its unique design. Additionally, the effects of gravity, air resistance, and other forces would likely play a role in determining the outcome. Ultimately, it would depend on the specific materials and design of the bridge, as well as the conditions under which it was built and maintained. And I'm like, okay. Nice. This thing's amazing. God damn, it's yeah. Um, I'm gonna give you like two more just to oh. give you a sense of what how about, how about how about how about this? We'll do one more because I have actually a, an additional thing about chat GPT. Okay. Um okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do one more. Um 
Uh, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't have it written down here, but I asked it. I'll just say I asked it philosophical questions, and one of them was, "You can take the frog out of the pond, but you can't take the pond out of the frog." What are your thoughts on this statement, ChatGPT? Very metaphorical, right? Like it's a yeah. very broad question. It's a very metaphorical question. It gave like an essay answer of what it thought about that. Um, I even asked ChatGPT. I said, "Hey, ChatGPT." do you worry that artificial intelligence will replace human artists? And it gave a response that was like outlying just to read some of it here. Um, Mm -hmm. It is true. It has the ability to generate art that is detailed and can do it quickly. However, it's important to remember that art is not just about technical skill or speed. It's about creativity, expression, and emotions. The ability to create arts that evokes emotion and tells a story is something that machines cannot replicate. Additionally, art is often a reflection of the artist's own experiences and perspectives which is something that artificial intelligence cannot can never replicate. Oh there, my God. The of AI and art would may change the world in the way art is created. It is unlikely to completely replace the need for human artists. This, this was is creepy, by- man. <laughs> like, God, yeah, that sounds so like, Oh my gosh. That's emotionally. F- ah, See, that's what's crazy. And I don't know if you saw, but Google tried like as soon as they saw it, chat GPT, they're like, we need one of those. So they went to this company, Anthropic, which if for people who don't know, it's an artificial intelligence company. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to make their own Google version called Brad. Now they rushed the development on Brad. And I don't know if you saw this, Caleb, but in the news, they're like, okay, Brad, give me some information about you know astronomy that I could tell my nine-year-old son. And they're like, did you know that the first photo was taken by like this, like this person? And it got it incorrect. They said that statement, but it was actually like a researcher that was like from like 60 years prior. And they got it wrong and they lost over like a hundred billion dollars in investments. Yes. And I, I, Elon Musk's cyber truck controversy all over again. Oh yeah. With the invincible truck window and just breaking. Well, that's the thing. And then you know what you want to know what's crazy is you know Bing that nobody uses. Look at <laughs> Microsoft isn't making it, so they're infusing Bing, the actual search engine, with Chat GPT to make it so they're more accurate search engine. And they already built a prototype of it. Yep, yep. And they're they're like, and their statement was, "We're tired of being the second step from Google. We want to be first. And <laughs> Now it's just the race of the AI. And I think that's just crazy. I never thought that was going to happen so quickly. Maybe apparently Brad will be available in a few weeks for everybody as a prototype. Kind of crazy, Caleb, how AI is just catching up and scary too. Would you, um, would you mind if I read you an email? I know I read it to you last week, but I'd like to read it for the podcast. Um, hey man, yeah, sure. If you want to read it for the podcast, sure. Um, <clears throat> so I wrote this email to my great grandfather about a week ago, and I'll read it fast. I'll read it fast. Hey Papa, I hope you're keeping well. Papa's what I call my great grandfather because there's <laughs> it just it don't time. worry, don't worry about the semantics. It's okay. You're good. You're good. Um, I hope you're keeping well. I've wanted to talk to you for a very long time, and I've also had a question for quite a very long time that most people don't seem to have an answer for. I just realized today that you're the person I want to talk to about this. Forgive the length of this email, but it takes a while for me to build up to my question. I know that in your lifetime, you've watched computers develop from their infancy into what they are today. And right now, they're reaching a level of sophistication that humans have begun to refer to as artificial intelligence. There are computers operating today that are smarter than any person who has ever lived. I've spent these past few days talking with a particular computer called ChatGPT. To say I'm marveled by it would be an understatement. You can ask it to write a 10-page paper on Indian religion, to solve a complex riddle, or write a poem about sleeping on the moon, and it will accomplish any of these tasks in a matter of seconds. I have learned more about biology from talking to this computer for an afternoon than I could have in two weeks of grade 11. It can carry whole conversations about complex social issues and make predictions about civilizations on other planets. With all of this being said, what are humans left to do? What do you think we should make of a world where computers are better manufacturers than people, better inventors than people, better drivers than people, better writers than people, better cooks than people, and now maybe better artists than people? I've Mm. seen things that are more vibrant and more detailed than anything I'll ever make in one lifetime. 
and they were generated in a fraction of a second. It's starting to get difficult to tell if I'm having an online conversation with a human or a computer program, which is very, very good at acting like a human. A good many people are going to lose their jobs to machines in the coming years. Millions already have. The forecasts that these machines will create just as many jobs as they cost don't have a lot of evidence backing them up, other than the facts that humans have dealt with these sorts of problems before. Economic concerns aside, these new creatures are starting to eclipse human life as a concept worth valuing. The human mind just isn't big enough to rival this new generation of electronics. Best, Caleb. How, how do you answer that question, both viewers and the Michael I'm talking to right now? And the Michael. Um, well, you know, just like uh, you know, we, we mentioned last week, really hard to give an answer. You know, I'm actually going to stick with the chat GPT's answer, and it's our personal experiences and interactions with the world. This is what I actually said last week before I knew the chat GPT. It's our interactions with the world that make it unique. Not no singular person experiences the things that we do the same way or in like the order that we do or the specific like unique out like you know interactions of it. So when we look at each other's lives, right? We have our own sets of experiences which create our own self. Now, you could argue that with AI, they have the entire his like all of our knowledge of the world is in that maybe but it does not have our perspective because everybody's perspective is different and that is what makes humans unique and i think that is my answer that i know that it might seem like you know scary that ai is developing at a rapid rate it can even mimic very much of the human qualities that we deem as human but we forget that the things that make us human are those perspective and interactions because those are the things that create new things and new ideas. And without that, there would be no chat GPT. There would be nothing. And that might not sound like a very like self, like, you know, like the, the human self egotistical. But unfortunately, like that's all I can kind of give. Is that's what makes humans. Yeah, that's all. That's all we can make up chief. Yeah, well, when you think about it, you could go like, oh, we're, ne we're unique because of art. We're unique because of reflection. We're unique because of this. Well, you can argue that in every single one of those things that we deem unique, yes, something else can do it, but they cannot do it with the unique perspective and taking an interaction of humans. That's what makes, if you, from a logical argument, that's the only one I can think of. I agree. I think there's a few things that humans have that computers don't. And one of those things is relationships. Um, That's what I kind of, yeah, the interaction. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm agreeing with you. This isn't to. Oh, this, okay. Okay. I thought, I thought you were saying, okay, no worries. No worries. Um, I'm, this is, this is an agreement with what you're saying. Um, well, for example, today I was just talking to chat GPT an hour ago and then you called and you're like, Hey, Caleb, do you want to do a podcast? And my answer wasn't, no, I'm going to talk to chat GPT. It knows no more about science. My answer was, no, you're a real person. Let's close the, let's exit this tab and let's actually have a conversation. Fair um, enough. I'd hope so. I value you as a human being more than the soulless cold wires of chat GPT. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Um, and, and you're right. The, uh, there also is something about the human perspective of, um, you're right. Just to flesh out what you're saying a bit. Um, like, a machine will never appreciate the beauty of a waterfall. It will only appreciate the quantity of liters of, you know, H2O that pours mm -hmm. over it every second. I guess it's approximate like sensory interpretation. Yeah. Um, like a, a robot will never appreciate the sadness of a book. They will only appreciate that. Um, yes. Two characters died at the end of, Okay, that's a very robotic answer. You know that it would give a very it would give it both a philosophical, psychological it interpretation, it but it can't understand it. It would just it wouldn't be appreciating it. It would just exactly it would be mimicking a human. It, it's like um, that's all it is though is a mimic. It's like a mimication of a human. That, that's something that I'm uh, sort of reassured me that I guess both my mom, my great grandfather, and my dad told me, which is that um, to a certain degree they are just parrots, like. 
all of the beauty of ChatGPT is that it was mm. raised by humans. And the reason it seems like such an impressive human is because it's a combination of so many of them. Um, not because it's something better than us, but because it's just all of us put together. Which seems like a, a really inspiring answer. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, and I, I hope that no one falls into the trap of forming romantic relationships with the new artificial intelligence girlfriends that we're going to see on the market. Like the AI on. robots that already exist. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I hope that uh, I kind of worry when I start to see like the, um, I guess, yeah, like some of the traps, for example, with, um, uh, what is it? It's something like, oh, imams at like mosques. I've heard about like digital, like AI imams at like mosques in my area. And I'm just listening. I'm like, why? And a mom is like a priest for those who don't know for like a Muslim. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. For like a Muslim church. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're called mosques and they, instead of priests, they have moms. Um, but like, it's like, uh, do we really want our religious leaders? I'm not a Muslim, but still like, do we really want our religious teachers to be robots? Um, do we want like robot pets as we've seen recently? Mm -hmm. Robot artists. Like I do feel like, Maybe it's humans mistaking these robots for people more so than the robots actually being humans. Um, mm, that's a really interesting yeah. opinion on that. Well, man, yeah, honestly, it's hard to say like what this, like the world that we're coming to. It's, it's a very scary thought that we're progressing so much in technology that we're able to replicate a lot of the human condition. And I think that's what's scary. Um, yeah, I think we're going to conclude this podcast episode here, though, because like, this is a lot of deep Thanks. thoughts. Uh, I want to thank you once again, Kalo, for coming on to this podcast and giving such a great like insight and opinion on a variety of topics. That we've covered. Thank you once again for coming on here. Thanks for having me on. Always, uh, always a pleasure to be here. Hey, I'm glad I'm glad you find it a pleasure that you enjoy being on here. I, I enjoy having you on here as well. And then uh, for the audience listening in, I uh, hope you all enjoyed yourselves. And if you want to like show your love and support, not only for this podcast, but for like my channel, the triangle button, just uh, leave a like, comment, subscribe, check out my other videos. I have plenty of playthroughs. I have an explanation video on Death Stranding that still needs you want to watch. And we have a bunch of podcast episodes on there as well. So other than that, we'll catch you on the next one. See you later. Godspeed.